Zoom. Um, we will start uh, this afternoon um, uh, program. And first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Cox uh, for um, hosting uh, this uh, session. As some of you may know, uh, Pastor Cox came in the early uh, 2000 um, to conduct a, um, a, a prayer meeting uh, with us. We were still a young um, and a church then, and we'd, uh, it's not, it wasn't too long since we had started uh, Kelvin. And uh, Pastor Cox came and uh, spent uh, qu quite uh, some time with us, and we really enjoyed, you know, his stay. He's become a good friend of 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 Kelvin, and uh, and he left us with good ideas. And and uh, I think we were about just under a hundred people when you came, and now we have at least about three hundred plus, you know, members at um, you know Kelvin. So we've continued to grow, and especially on your, your you know, on your, uh, um, you know, advice. And uh, I'd also like to thank you very much, uh, Pastor Cox, for your, um, your sermon earlier on, which was very uplifting. And I would, um, as per, well, regarding your uh, introductory, uh, um, uh, Pastor, my friend, um, in Romans 12, verse 19 says, God tells us never to take revenge and to leave it to the Lord. So regarding your revenge, uh, when I beat you on the golf course, just remember <laughs> Romans 12, verse 19. <laughs> um, without further ado, Pastor, I will hand over to you uh, to begin um, this afternoon's uh, uh, program. Okay, well, well, thank you, um, Percy. I, I tell you, uh, have we? I have great memories. My wife has uh, great memories. She was able to, if you remember, be with me the first half of the uh, meeting, and um, we've talked about that. It was it was somewhat uh, um, inflating when I had to go home and tell her how you had beat me like a uh, a bass drum and rode me like a government mule, um, but uh, it was it was great fellowship, and I I teasingly say that when we get to heaven, um, and actually come back to um, this uh, to the new earth, we will have an opportunity to do many of the things that we do now. Heaven cannot be so mystical that we lose sight that Adam and Eve were real people uh, in a real uh, garden with the opportunity to, to grow and to develop. And so uh, sometimes people think that heaven is going to be boring. There'll be nothing that we're able to do but uh, I enjoy um, reminiscing or uh, spending time just thinking about the possibilities. Um, travel that is not limited to uh, walking. Um, the idea of being able to, to see and not be hindered by uh, distance. Um, the idea that we will never uh, grow old. Uh, the message that uh, I shared uh, this morning primarily was a message of hope, uh, talking about the fact that it's going to be all right, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you are going through, that the end of the story is going to be a very positive one. Um, the, the Bible says that weeping can only endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Trouble, pain, and frustration all have an expiration date. Um, one of the things that my mother taught, uh, there were three, uh, three sons, and um, mother would take us to the store with her. 
and ask us to pick up certain things. So if you're going to buy bread, if you're going to buy milk, if you're going to buy those things that are perishable, she would say always read the expiration date, the date that you need to um, purchase uh, this particular item so that the manufacturer can guarantee that it's going to, to be good. It's an expiration uh, date in terms of its longevity and goodness. Well, death and pain and sorrow has an expiration date. And um, currently here in the States, we, we are uh, experiencing a, a great uh, increase in COVID-19. Uh, and while a vaccination date is um, supposed to be taking place um, sometimes early part of this year, it's going to take time for the government to provide it to the masses. And so um, there is a threaten, threatening of locking down again. Well, um, people are very frustrated about that. Um, but the government is saying, listen, hold on, because we have a vaccination that we believe is going to be 90% um, uh, good in uh, preventing the uh, onslaught or continuing the onslaught of, of COVID-19. Well, the government is excited about 90%, but our God uh, has said to us, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me and my father's house or many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you into myself so that where I am, there ye may be also. That's the promise of God's word. And by the way, by the way, uh, in the message um, this morning, uh, I talked about um, there are two types of, of prophecy. I didn't spend as much time because I was running out of time on the second half of that um, um, message. You know, there is conditional prophecy. Conditional prophecy is, is ultimately prophecies of promise. These are things that God has promised he will do but it requires our involvement. There is man's part and there is God's part. That's why the majority of those promises begin with if. Um, if uh, my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves. I have a responsibility. Uh, if um, we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. I have a responsibility. That's the conditional promises. If I meet those conditions, then God can be counted on to keep his word. But the second type of promise, promise is um, predictive promise. Um, um, predictive prophecy is prophecy that is going to happen whether we want it to or not. It was, it's like the old game hide in and seek. You know, you count to 10 and then the person says, here I come, rev, where, uh, ready or not. Predictive prophecy is what God says is going to happen. It is what he has declared to be his, his plan of salvation. It's the first promise given to us in Genesis um, 3.15, where God says, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. Nothing, nothing that man can do about that 
God says, I'm going to put that in you. That enmity that is spoken of is an uncomfortableness with our current situation or circumstance. It's God uh, causing us to become um, uh, aware of his presence and an uncomfortableness with our behavior, our thinking patterns, our position in life. And so that's predictive prophecy. It, it all, it happens to us. It's what the Holy Spirit uses to get our attention in many instances to introduce us uh, to God. Another predictive prophet uh, prophecy is Daniel 2, where uh, Daniel is, um, well, let me go before Daniel, a heathen king uh, who is wondering in his mind, King Nebuchadnezzar, what the future held. God provides him an outlook on the future. And he has this dream in Daniel 2. He cannot remember what the dream is. He calls his um, wise men together. They aren't able to say or tell what the circumstances of the dream are. And the king becomes so angry, he decides that he's going to kill them all. And the word gets to Daniel, and Daniel and the uh, uh, three Hebrew friends begin to pray, and God reveals the dream to Daniel, which is a dream of the future. And so the dream starts with uh, what uh, has happened in the past, what is going to take place now, and what is going to occur in the future. And you know, Daniel 2 is the declaration of four world ruling kingdoms, um, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And after that, there wouldn't be another world ruling power. And then there is a a stone cut out of a mountain that comes and hits the, the base of the image and God's kingdom is set up. Imagine that. Daniel is given um, insight into a, a, the dream of a heathen king. God loves us so much that he responds to the concerns of a heathen king to let him know what the future is and it gives him an opportunity in essence to to accept a god who the one of his distinctions is his ability to tell the end from the beginning and is because god has already worked through a plan through which each individual can be saved. Now, um, there's been individuals that will say, well, the devil made me do it. Well, I, I'm sorry, you really can't make that excuse to say that the devil made you do it. We do wrong because deep down in our hearts, that's what we wanna do. Now, I know that's kind of difficult to hear uh, this evening. Um, but listen, if God will not use his power to force us to do something against our will, do you actually think he will allow the devil to force you to do something against your will? What the devil does is he brings about temptation, but temptation is not sin. Jesus was tempted. But we have the power and the means through the authority of the word of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit here on this earth to overcome every malady, to uh, look on the brighter side of every situation if we have uh, 
patience and belief and faith to believe that God is who he says he is, that he can do what he says he can do, and that he's in the process of doing it even when we don't see the evidence. And we ended the message um, in Revelation where God was talking to John and, and, and God comes to, to John on the Isle of Patmos and he says in Revelation uh, 1, um, 17, 18, and 19, John, write what you see. Write the past, write the present, write the future. And then when you get to Revelation 21 and 22, he says, now write because these things that I have shared with you are true and faithful. There will be a time when God will come. Don't get discouraged by the, your circumstances. Don't become discouraged by a uh, delay. Don't become discouraged by unmet expectations. God can be counted on to do exactly what he says he will do in his good uh, time. So um, that was the basis of the message uh, today. And um, it may be that some individuals have some questions or comments or thoughts that um, I can uh, potentially respond to. But again, it is certainly my privilege and my um, uh, pleasure to, to meet with the Calvin uh, Church uh, this evening. So are there any, any questions or, or thoughts or I can uh, continue to elaborate on our uh, circumstances? Percy, are you there? Yes, I am, I'm here. Okay. How, how would you like me to proceed? Um, uh, maybe uh, if uh, people uh, raise their hand and then, um, the host will um, will notify you, and then we can uh, just unmute the person and, and allow them to to ask you uh, to ask their question. Uh, since I don't see any hands that are raised, maybe you know we we can um, we can continue and um, and go ahead. Okay. All right. Well, you know, um, I guess elaborating a little more on the. Um, on predictive uh, prophecy. Um, what makes the Bible different from any and all of the books uh, is that it gives us insight into God's uh, plan, um, the plan of salvation. Uh, one of the um, blessings of being able to study the books of Daniel and Revelation. Daniel is the Old Testament um, major um, prophecy book and Revelation, excuse me, the New Testament uh, major prophecy book. It's interesting that um, God gives us information on his first coming and then he gives us information on his second coming. The irony is that people were not ready for his first coming. When I say people, I'm talking about, in general, the church. Um, it is so easy to be around religious things and become so distracted that we don't uh, study the word of God, we don't uh, keep a sense of reality. Um, that's what faith does. Faith gives us a reality that is not based upon uh, uh, sight. It is based upon the 
what it is that you believe, the promises of God's word. It is interesting. Um, I was uh, studying the other day uh, on this, this, um, this thought uh, process that the church was not prepared for the second coming of Christ. But those who were diligent in their studies, as an example, wise men from the East were following the stars and they, the star, and they recognized that this was the prophecy that had um, uh, been uh, foretold of this king that was going to be born, this Messiah. When Jesus came, of course, he made it clear, my kingdom is not of this world. Uh, his mission was to set us free from the penalty of sin and of death. When Adam and Eve sinned, they actually, their penalty was death. God's intention for them was to live throughout eternity. And I know that uh, in our, in our uh, climate now, eternity can, can uh, be hard to explain. A, a little uh, boy asked his, his mom, what, how long is eternity? And um, uh, she said, son, do you, you remember us running through the sand on the beach? And he said, yes. She says, eternity is the amount of time it would take for you to take one grain of sand and move it to another location. And he said, oh, mom, that would take forever. And she says, that's what eternity is. It's, it's forever. God never intended for us to get sick. God never intended for us to experience fear. God never intended for us to, to grow old. God's intent for us was that we would live throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity with uh, vitality and, and vigor and never experience any pain. But because of sin, then all of these elements were entered uh, into the, the life of, of um, men and, and women. And so God now has a plan to move us back out of time into eternity. And, um, and so the first element of that is to have someone come who is equal to the law of God and show that it is possible to live a sinless life and that's Jesus. And so when you read the Bible, you get a sense of uh, how he was going to, um, how he was going to be born, where he was going to be um, uh, born, um, how his death, his resurrection, um, his, his virgin birth, uh, his ascension, his ministry in the heavenly sanctuary, all of these things are specifically identified in the word of God so that we know what the end will be. And yet, with all of this information, all of the, the things that I have shared, his virgin birth, his atoning death, his resurrection, his ascension, uh, his ministry in the heavenly sanctuary, his second coming, all of these things are outlined uh, for us in scripture so that we have something to base our faith 
and our hope on. And um, that's on his first coming. And um, the church was not ready for that. There were uh, individuals in the church, but the organized uh, church as a whole was not ready for that. They had uh, become so consumed with living uh, in this world and making things comfortable for themselves. And let me pause here to say there's nothing wrong with living comfortable. The Bible says that we ought to occupy until he comes, but the purpose of living comfortable should not override our purpose and our uh, desire for Jesus to come. And uh, the servant of the Lord in uh, Desire of Ages uh, talks about the fact that uh, angels of heaven were so excited about the nearness of the birth of Christ that they came to the earth looking and expecting individuals, particularly within the church, to be focused on his soon arrival. And she talks about how the, the angels um, uh, visited uh, different uh, groups of individuals thinking that they would be excited about his, his first coming and they were disappointed because they were, the people were so focused on the things of this world, they had no focus on Jesus coming the first time. And then they were on their way, getting ready to go back to heaven when they saw some shepherds that were tending sheep and they were talking about the uh, coming of the Messiah. And the angels were so enthused and excited to see uh, and hear individuals talking about the coming of the Messiah that their brilliance lit up the countryside. And um, they began to sing glory to God in the highest peace and goodwill on earth. Um, the, the heathen um, came looking. They were aware of the signs in the sky that the Messiah was to be born. And King Herod, who was a part of the church, did not recognize that that time was, was uh, present. And he called for the uh, ministers in the, the church, the scribes, and they came and they told them, uh, told him about the prophecy that a child would be born in Bethlehem. And you remember um, the king in an, in an effort to disavow the prophecy uh, made a decree that every, all male children two years and under should be killed. But an angel had already come and told Joseph to get the boy and uh, take him to Egypt where he would be safe with the brethren. And um, uh, these, are, these are things that when we read the, the word helps to give us, uh, uh, it helps to build our faith and, and our outlook that everything is going to be all right. Just as the Bible foretold the circumstances, the condition, the time of the birth of Christ, which was his first coming, it tells us in terms of the second coming, what would take place. Men would be lovers of themselves more than lovers of, of God. There would be pestilence uh, in diverse places. Uh, the, the environment would be at risk. There would be um, earthquakes and storms. There would be 
violence uh, all uh, over. Uh, we get the, the times that we are living in. Jesus then says, listen, um, make sure that you don't miss the signs of his soon uh, return. Luke is the one that gives us insight to say, um, uh, you can see the wars and the rumors of wars. You can see the earthquakes. You can see times changing. But listen, there is another danger. And Luke says that danger is that uh, we get caught up in riotous living and drunkenness. And then he says, which I believe is the most uh, common even in the church, uh, he says, and the cares of this world. Cares of this world actually means that there can be good things that's going on in your life. And you become so focused on those good things, you lose sight of what it is that God is, is wanting um, to do. Um, you can get caught up in your job. You can get uh, caught up in your, your family relationships so that you are so focused even on the family that you don't have what is necessary to maintain the family, which is a relationship um, with God. And so uh, Jesus says, be careful that you don't leave me out, Jesus said of anything and everything that you do. Paul says it like this, whatsoever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. You say, okay, well, I, I've got to live. I, I've got to uh, maintain uh, a certain lifestyle. And Jesus comes back and says, well, listen, I understand that. And that's a part of maintaining until I come. But here's what I want you to do. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all of these other things will be given or granted uh, to you. And so that's the process of us putting God first. Um, first thing you do if you want to have a great day Make sure you spend some time with the Lord. Paul says, pray without ceasing. He's not talking about you being on your knees all day long. He's talking about you being mindful of your connectivity with God. I was talking to some young people and I said to them, um, what things have you done? that if you knew your parents was there, you would not have done it. And some of them started blushing. Well, the truth of the matter is, we serve a God that we're never outside of his presence. What happens if we were to begin to sense and recognize that the presence of God is with us wherever we go. The psalmist David, and I quoted this in the message this morning, um, where um, the psalmist says, whether shall I flee from thy spirit, or whether shall I go from thy presence, if I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed, in the ground, the King James Version, in hell, that's talking about the grave, God is there. If I should take the wings of the morning and dwell in the othermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, nay, for the darkness and the light of both alike to thee. What would happen if we had a realization of the fact that everything we do, everything we say, 
is in the presence of God. You know, at one time, um, uh, Israel uh, felt that they had a they had a um, um, they had secured God so that um, in the process of learning, God gave them the sanctuary. If you look at the way that the sanctuary was constructed, it was to be a model to help teach Israel um, how important the presence of God is. So um, this model of the sanctuary had three compartments. It had the outer gate where uh, an, an animal was bought, uh, it was washed, it was taken to the altar, uh, the lamb's throat was uh, cut, and uh, it was a, a symbol of death providing life for the sinner through cleansing. And uh, that was the first part of, of the sanctuary. And then you moved into the holy place. In the holy place, you had the table of showbread, which was the symbol of God's word being able to uh, sustain us. You had the seven golden candlesticks, which was a symbol of um, God giving us uh, light and direction. You had the uh, altar of incense um, that uh, was set right before the veil of the temple that separated the holy place from the most holy place. Now the altar of incense was a symbol of the prayers of the uh, petitioners going up. At the top of the tent, there was about a foot difference between the uh, top of the veil and the top of the tent so that as the incense rose, it would go to the top and then it would have space to go over into the most holy place symbolizing that the present our prayers would come directly into the presence of God. Um, nobody was allowed to go into the most holy place except once a year on the day of atonement and the high priest would go in uh, to it. Um, it's interesting um, this isn't recorded in the word, but Ellen White talks about it in history, uh, confirms the fact that they would tie a rope around the high priest uh, feet and on the high priest garments, there were bells so that as the high priest moved around in the most holy place, as long as you heard the bells, you knew that he was alive. But if the bells stopped um, making noise, um, they could not go into the, the presence of God in the most holy place. They would have to drag him out. Inside the most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant. Inside the Ark of the Covenant was the Ten Commandments. On top of the Ark of the Covenants were two uh, cherubims or angels and they bowed um, their, their wings uh, over the Ark of the Covenant. And when that arch was formed, there was a light referred to as the Shekinah glory that actually represented the presence of God. And so the sanctuary service was used as a model to help individuals know that there was a way to get out of the mess that is in this world. Well, when Jesus died on the, the cross, uh, you remember when he said, uh, it is finished, fall into thy hands. I commend my spirit. The 
veil in the temple was split, not from the bottom up, but from the top down, which represented that God was doing this. This is God's plan to restore man into his original uh, intention. And so um, Paul then elaborating on it even more says, listen, um, God has moved the tabernacle, his tabernacle from a place with uh, brick and mortar and he has come to live inside of us. Um, the Bible says that, that um, the Spirit of God now resides in us. So think about this. Everywhere your feet touch now becomes holy ground. That's one of the reasons why it's a blessing to understand that even though um, throughout the world, certainly um, uh, in the United States right now, and I was talking to Percy a little earlier, and, and he was talking about um, why we're doing, doing Zoom meetings, because uh, it's not the best thing to uh, congregate together. Well, uh, the church is not just brick and mortar. We are the church. God lives inside of us. And so um, that's, that's one of the things that we begin to, to recognize with a greater focus that now, right now, God lives inside of us. And because he lives inside of us, the Holy Spirit resides inside of us. We have power to be all that God wants us to be. The Bible says to him that is able to keep you from falling. If there is some malady, some circumstance that we face in life that God cannot give us victory over, he ceases to be God. And so there's power, wonder working power in the blood of the lamb. God has shared this in his word and it is predictive prophecy. These are the things that will happen. And so we, we hear Paul saying, he that hath begun a good work in us is going to complete it. And so you have to have the faith to believe that God is who he says he is. He can do what he says he can do. And he's in the process of doing it even when we don't see the evidence. Uh, we have to have the faith to believe that, as Peter says, we've not believed cunningly devised fables. What we have been exposed to is the truth of what God is doing in our lives. And as we do our part, God will do his part until time um, for Jesus to come back and nothing we can do to stop it. He's going to come back. The question is whether or not we want to be ready uh, when he comes. And so that's the message of, of hope. That's the message of assurance that all is going to, to be well. I've been preaching now for 41 years, and the, the message has not changed. Uh, you, you, you find out in life what things are most important, and God gives us time. He gives us opportunity. I would end by, by saying uh, to you that uh, God loves each and every one of us. He knows everything there is to know about you. He knows your secrets. He knows your fears. He knows your pain. He knows your concerns. And he is concerned about you. God's greatest purpose 
and hear me well, God's greatest purpose is not just to give us what we want because what we want may not be best for us. His greatest purpose is to save us. I tell individuals that in order to be lost, one must fight against God and win. In order to be saved, one may fight against God, but he loses. To surrender oneself to God is the greatest decision we can ever make. To help lead individuals to, to Christ is one of the greatest opportunities we have ever been given. I want you to know that Jesus is soon to come. The world can't continue to last um, much longer. The environmentalists are telling us that there is a clock that is ticking that uh, unless we begin to do things to reverse the direction that our planet is going in, our planet will become inhabitable uninhabitable. And so um, we have these signs all around us in reference to how time is winding up. And I'm not trying to say that if God doesn't come by year X, then we lose faith or belief that God's word can be counted on. No, God's word can be counted on. Uh, Peter says, listen, God is not slack concerning his promises as some men count slackness. He says, but he's long suffering, not willing that any should perish. I know for me, I am thankful that God has delayed his, his coming to give individuals, sometimes it's family members, sometimes it's, it's us personally, that God is wanting to give every chance, every opportunity uh, for us to make a decision to follow him all the way, all right? So uh, it's going to be all right. God is going to see us through this, this process, okay? Um, I don't know. Are there any questions? Yes, yes there is one. Uh, there is one uh, question from Tandy. Tandy, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you for that. So my question is based on how do we react? What, what do you think we should take away from the current pandemic and what's happening globally, really? And this is in relation to we don't want another 1844 situation where all hope was now thrown in. Well, this is it. This is the end. Forget everything else. But at the same time, you also then hear, well, 100 years ago, there was a Spanish flu and it was actually worse than what's happening now. So we are overreacting. So how do you balance? How do we balance reading into what's actually happening here without veering towards any of those extremes? OK, that's an excellent um, question. Uh, and quite honestly, it comes down to our personal relationship with God. Um, servant of the Lord says that Jesus could have come at any time. Okay. And um, because he is patient and waiting on us, um, that time has been uh, delayed. And so... The Bible says that we ought to occupy until he comes. So we, what, what we do in our personal walk with God is we stay in touch with him. It's like I've got a lamp next to me and this lamp doesn't have any power unless it's plugged into the wall. If I unplug it from the wall, then the light goes out. I've got to stay plugged in to the power of Christ in, in my life. 
I recognize those things that are necessary to maintain my faith, my relationship, my walk with God. Circumstances may change. Uh, expectations may change. Delay, as I shared in the message, these are all things that can change and have an impact upon my faith. But I've got to continue to feed my faith on a day-to-day -day basis. Remember, Hebrew says that without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So since God has already outlined his, his plan of salvation, that's what I'm focusing on. Okay, so if delay comes, if he doesn't come in the next 10 years, I'm still waiting. Okay, uh, and I'm going to wait until my eyes closes in, in death, believing that when Jesus comes, he's going to resurrect me. That, that's my focus. Um, and Prophecy then helps to create an urgency so that I don't lose sight of the fact that every minute that I'm living draws me closer to the time when he comes. That's my reality. All right. So the pandemic comes. That scene is supposed to be uh, available soon. And this pandemic may uh, pass but it also may usher in the end. And so my focus is not necessarily on what is going on around me, but me staying ready for Jesus to come at any time. One last thing I would say to you, <clears throat> and I shared this a little bit in the message um, this morning, the 10 virgins, okay, they were all members of the church. They all had lamps. They all had a measure of, of oil. The challenge was they didn't prepare for the delay, five of them, okay? And so what we have to do as Christians is prepare for the delay. Make sure that uh, you're reading your word on a day-to-day -day basis. Make sure that you're in touch with God so that he is speaking directly to you and you can be sure that whether or not it is God by placing what is being said to you against the word of God. The Bible becomes a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. So that process, that process, whether it takes place um, and um, um, let's say next week sometimes, or it takes place next year or years from now, that delay doesn't have an impact upon my faith because my faith is based upon the word of God. Thanks, Pastor. Can I just make a follow-up question? So. That, that gives me a sense in terms of me as an individual. And then us as the body of Christ, so us as a church, uh, how do you think, because it, we, we haven't still gone back to church. There's talks that we may be going physically to church next month. Um, what do we do differently as a result of the time that, we, do we acknowledge the fact that there must be something done differently or do we just go back to, well, you know, church as usual? What, what should be our mindset as the body? Um, that's a really good question. Um, our theme that we used within uh, our conference was ministry beyond the walls. Unfortunately, uh, we can, um, it's, it's like a drug addict who gets their fix. So going to church can be a fix for us. We become accustomed to what we do and how we do it. And it becomes habit forming without having the real experience with Jesus Christ. 
But we got to be very careful that we don't fall into that that trap. Okay, so uh, now uh, our churches are um, our churches are not open either. Uh, many of our churches, okay, and so uh, people get a chance to sleep in on Sabbath. So what happens when the virus uh, goes away and now you got to get up on Sabbath morning to, to go to church and you, you, it's the danger is you become so comfortable that those things that were habits then became the norm in your life doesn't have the same motivation now because for a period of time you have stopped doing that which is normal. You have to be very careful of that. The Bible says that we should not neglect the assembling of ourselves together. So like, so even though we are not physically together, it becomes important that we still go through a process of uh, worshiping on the Sabbath day. And what are things that we can uh, do? What opportunities uh, is God giving us to witness to our families and our friends in this unique environment. Uh, there's an old adage that says that every crisis is an opportunity, okay? So as we are going through this, this uh, pandemic, then what uh, special opportunities does it give us to share with our friends the times that we are living in, to open up an opportunity to witness uh, to others. So that's why we use the uh, theme ministry beyond um, the walls. The church is not just brick and mortar. We are the church. And so we can now use this time to share our faith and to talk with uh, others in reference to the soon return of the Lord. Thank you. Okay, all right, God bless you. Um, Pastor, I just wanted to ask one question um, also to, um, uh, you know, considering what we're going through. Um, um, uh, a church member of ours, um, her mother passed away during COVID-19 and um, a couple of days after burying uh, the mother, her father, you know, passed away. Wow. Now, now, now what, what, what coping skills do I give that person? And what do I tell them um, that, you know, um, yes, you know, we, we have to have this blessed hope, but, you know, what, what coping skills can I give this person who has lost a mother and, and a father who, who was a former pastor, she grew up in the church, that's all what she knows. But what, what coping skills can I give that person? Every temptation is designed mm -hmm. to attack our faith. And so what does the Bible uh, have, have to say in reference to how our faith is strengthened? Okay, our faith is, first of all, God has given to each of us a measure of faith. So we have something to start off with. But how is our faith strengthened? Our faith is strengthened through relationship with God. Okay, so that's prayer. That's studying of the word. That's fellowshipping with like believers. One, one of the, the things that, in terms of coping, you know, from a, a medical perspective, uh, they talk about getting into support groups, all right, because people who have similar experiences can, as they talk about their experiences, helps others who are going through that experience to know that there is hope, that there is opportunity for growth and success. Um, our presidential election 
um, has just been uh, confirmed uh, yesterday that uh, Biden uh, has gotten the necessary votes and it's confirmed by um, um, the majority of the states. So uh, Trump is not going to be president after January uh, 20th. But having, having said that, um, uh, Biden uh, has gone through major loss when he was a younger um, uh, senator. He lost his wife and his daughter in an automobile accident. And he shares that experience with others who have gone through loss and strength is gained. Um, he had a stuttering problem as a kid uh, growing up. He has shared that experience uh, with others and there is a gain. That's one of the blessings of having church fellowship, okay? Um, the New Testament church had great fellowship where they would rehearse the goodness of God. Don't become distracted by the losses or the difficulties that um, you face. Others have gone through what you are going through. And when you communicate and you talk to one another about how you've made it through, it becomes a blessing to others. So uh, it's good for the church to do just what you all are doing this morning. You're not able to physically touch one another, but through technology, you can come together and you can talk, you can share um, with one another. That's why the Bible says, share ye uh, one another's uh, burdens, okay? Because what you are going through and what you have survived, others are now going through, and it becomes a source of survival. We have to, here, here is one thing that I, I share with uh, individuals who are going through great uh, pain and sorrow, okay? We cannot afford <clears throat> to attach permanence to temporary situations, okay? That's a key element of survival. Don't attach permanence to a temporary situation, okay? And I'm gonna say it a third time. Don't attach permanence to a temporary situation. You say, well, um, I've lost a, a loved one to, to death or, or I'm sick and I, the, the outlook is not good, okay? Well, the outlook is based not upon what you, you see. It, the outlook is based upon what God has said, okay? There is, as I shared early on, there is an expiration date to all of our pain and suffering. And so you've got to hold, hold on. I, I remember this just came to mind. Um, there, there was a um, experiment that um, a doctor uh, did in terms of hope and, and uh, uh, President Obama uh, talked about the audacity of hope. Well, this is this is what he did. He he took um, lab uh, mice. He took one, put them in a um, container of water, put a lid on it, and watched how long the mouse was able to stay afloat and, and live. And within darkness by himself, the mouse was not able to sustain life very long. Then he put 
um, two mice in and the uh, container of, of water. And he took the lid off so that there was light uh, available to them. And they were able to maintain much longer, okay? And what he gathered from the experience is when we come together, if there is someone who will go through the experience with us, that helps to bring uh, hope. If there is light, when that light becomes the word of God, if there is light, then that helps to enable us to, to hold on. And so what I would say is none of us are facing unique circumstances. Somebody has gone through what you are facing. If it's, if it's a, a health challenge, um, if it is a financial challenge, I mean, er everything is going to be managed within our faith relationship with God and God is going to uh, see us through, okay? And so that's, that's what I have, you know, that, that's what I have taught, that's what I've experienced in my, my personal life and I seek to encourage individuals in that manner. Thank you very much, my friend and brother um, uh, for uh, your, your message and especially waking up early in the morning uh, to give us uh, a, a word. Um, I'm glad my wife is also listening in who lost her brother and uh, we also preparing funeral arrangements uh, to, 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 you know, to bury him at this difficult time. And um, I wish you all the best, uh, my friend, and uh, also wish you uh, your mother health and your, your father. And um, we hopefully, when this COVID is over, we will invite you back to, um, you know, back to South Africa to preach and and have that uh, game of golf where you can um, do your final revenge. And um, thank you very much for those who were able to to dial in. At this moment, I will ask uh, our elder um, Matladi Solfafa Maponga to close in a word of prayer. If you could unmute, unmute yourself, uh, Matladi. <clears throat> Thank you so, so much, Percy. Thank you so much, Doctor, for uh, time you spend with us during divine service. And of course, in the afternoon, may you be blessed together with your family. Uh, blessings. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the privilege of Sabbath. We thank you that we can rest in you, Lord. We, we thank you for the powerful uh, messages that we got from the doctor. Lord, we pray that these messages should be able to transform us and make us better people. We also pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you touch his mother who's not feeling well. We pray that your will be done, Lord, as we begin a new week, Lord. We pray for new messages and new grace. Um, we pray this, Lord, knowing that he who began a good work in us, you are faithful, Father, to complete the work till you come in clouds of glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, my friend. All and right. we will chat via WhatsApp. All right. Blessings Thank on you, you and the uh, church family as mm -hmm. a whole. And look forward to us uh, getting together uh, soon. Thank Peace. you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.